Well, happy Sabbath to you all, and happy to everyone out there on the, uh, the webcast today. Um, when I was preparing the subject, um, I knew that Brian was speaking, but um, I completely forgotten he spoke about evidence of the Spirit, part one, and uh, he would be likely speaking about that uh, today and concluding that. So this should dovetail in quite nicely with what he'll have to present afterwards. Now, some time back, I received an email from a friend who posed a rather interesting question to me. He wrote the following. The topic of speaking in tongues is a massive one in Pentecostal churches that I came out of, and I now don't believe what they teach, but still have friends trying to encourage me to speak gibberish, nonsensical tongues. My question is, what does Paul mean in 1 Corinthians 13.1 when he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. That last part throws me. What language of angels? The Pentecostals claim this backs up their speaking in made-up nonsensical languages, as if some out-of-this-world language no man knows. Now, his question got me looking into the subject of speaking in tongues, and today I'd like to cover what the Bible has to say about the gift of tongues. Now there are three passages of that speak. Oh, sorry, three examples of speaking in tongues in the New Testament, plus four other passages which discuss this subject that we're going to look at today. Now the three examples are found in Acts two, Acts ten, and Acts nineteen. Now in the Great Commission, Jesus mentioned speaking with new tongues. That's one of those signs that we've sung about before. And Paul discusses tongues in three consecutive chapters of 1 Corinthians 1. Now let's look at the best known example of speaking in tongues that occurred on the day of Pentecost following Christ's resurrection over in Acts 2. Now from the start of the chapter we read, Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house that they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now let's notice some passages from this point. Now there were visitors here to Jerusalem who had come from Parthia, Medium, Media, Elam and Mesopotamia, or part of the Parthian Empire at the time, as well as parts of the Roman Empire. Now, they recognised the apostles were Galileans, now most likely because of their distinctive Galilean accent noted in the Gospels. Now, it specifically states that each visitor heard them speaking in the tongue or language of the place in which they were born. Now, the apostles did not, not know all the languages of which the visitors heard them speak in. The apostles would have spoken in either Aramaic or Greek, and then God, by divine miracle, caused those words to be heard by the visitor in their own native language. Now, they could make out their accent when they heard them speak. Now, it's hard to make out if they saw their lips speaking in the apostles' language or that of the hearers. Now, probably the closest analogy that I could that I could give to what this may have been like is very similar to the Universal Translator on the TV show Star Trek, which makes all aliens appear to magically speak English so they can communicate without any language barrier. 
Now, some Bible scholars note that the miracle of speaking in tongues is the opposite of the Tower of Babel. Now, because they were defying God at the Tower of Babel, God divided the languages, creating the language barrier. Now, in these miracles, in order to glorify him and help others learn about his ways, God then removes the language barrier. Now, a very important point to note in Acts 2 is the purpose of this miracle noted in verse 11. It says, We hear them speak in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, this miracle removed the language barrier so they could hear and learn about the wonderful works of God that the apostles were teaching. Now, how different to the so-called languages spoken in Pentecostal churches today, which actually puts up a language barrier rather than breaking that barrier down. Now, in Pentecostal churches, these actions are focused on making the self good and not about sharing and helping others with the truth of God. Now, this event fulfilled what Jesus said would happen when he gave the Great Commission. And he said that his believers would speak with new tongues. <clears throat> now, the second example of speaking in tongues is a few chapters over in Acts chapter 10. Now, starting in verse 44, we read, Now, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, in verse 23, it says that some brethren from Joppa came with Peter to see Cornelius' household when this miracle occurred. Now, God showed his approval for the conversion of the Gentiles by doing the very same miracle that occurred in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Now, notice the last sentence. Now, here it says that they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, those of the circumcision understood what they were saying and heard them in their own language glorifying God. Now, the third example of speaking in tongues is found in Acts chapter 19. Now, it's Paul's second time to Ephesus on his third missionary journey. Now, he runs across some disciples who only knew of the repentance and baptism of John the Baptist. Now, then it says in verse 6, And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, nothing here is mentioned of what the languages were or if the people could understand them, though the mentioning of prophesying implies that. Now, when I lived in England uh, over 10 years ago now, I took a trip over to Switzerland for a weekend and went to Zurich for Sabbath services. Now, a member was on hand to translate the sermon for me, so that was a real blessing, having someone with the gift of speaking both German and English to help me to understand the sermon. Now, while that was a learned skill rather than a miracle, that was a great example of what the gift of tongues is all about. Now, when it came to singing the hymns, I happened to be sharing a hymnal with a rather lovely German-speaking lady. I wanted to get to know her a little bit afterwards, but unfortunately, she didn't speak a bit of English. Now, I was kicking myself afterwards, thinking, why did I give up German after grade eight? Now, that was one time that I really wish I had the gift of tongues. Now, now that we've looked at the two miraculous examples of speaking tongues... Well, and that third one in Acts 19. Let's now go over to 1 Corinthians 13 and try to answer the question posed by my friend earlier. <coughs> <coughs> now, Paul here, starting in verse 1, writes, Though I speak with the gift of the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but not have love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but not have love, 
it profits me nothing. Now, Paul here is saying that if he, if he can speak in lots of different languages of men, and even the language spoken of by angels, and you all Bible knowledge and prophecies, and his actions, including a great many outward acts of generosity, if they weren't motivated by love, then all those physical gifts are worthless. Now, Paul was emphasising that our gifts, including speaking in tongues, are not for ourselves and for our own vanity. They are to teach other people God's ways and to help and benefit other people. Now, in relation to the language of angels, angels have been around a lot longer than man. So there must be a language that they have used long before men were created, presumably which they and God communicate with. Now, since we don't know what that language sounds like, it seems like we can neither prove nor disprove whether the unintelligible utterances spoken by Pentecostals is a language of angels or not, which is rather convenient for those who wish to deceive. Now, one well-known millennial prophecy in relation to languages is given in Zephaniah 3.9. Now, it says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now, the New King James, in regards to this language, uses the word restore, implying an existing language, while the King James Version translates the Hebrew as turn. Now, the language used by the angels and God in heaven may or it may not be this pure language that God will introduce in the millennium. We just have to wait and see. Now, as I'd never seen Pentecostals speak in tongues as they claim, I watched a few YouTube videos claiming uh, to, where Pentecostals were claiming to speak in tongues, and it really didn't sound like gibberish. In some cases, it sounded more like Klingon, and in one video I saw, someone even added funny subtitles. Now, there was another video I watched where a little girl supposedly was able to understand these utterances spoken by a couple of other people in the video. Now, this reminded me of something that I saw on a hypnotist show on TV many years ago, where two people were having a conversation in gibberish and could actually understand each other and laughing at each other's jokes. Now, to me, that was a good illustration of how the power of suggestion is very powerful and can have a powerful impact on those who are open to it. Now, there's been some rather interesting research done on the Pentecostal phenomenon of speaking in tongues, as noted in the Wikipedia article about this subject. Now, Felicitas Goodman, an anthropologist and linguist, found that the speech patterns reflected the patterns of the speaker's native language. Now, William Samarin found much the same thing in his five years of recorded research. Now, he wrote that Pentecostal speaking in tongues was, I quote, meaningless but phonologically structured human utterance believed by the speaker to be a real language but bearing no systematic resemblance to any natural language, living or dead, end of quote. Now, Goodman also compared it to similar phenomena in other non-Christian tribal religions and found that there was no difference between them. Now, in 1 John 4, verse 1, John told members to test the spirits and warn his readers not to be taken in by spiritual appearing phenomena, implying that demon spirits might imitate spiritual gifts in an attempt to confuse people. Now let's look at the final place where Paul speaks about the gift of tongues over in 1 Corinthians 14. Now starting in verse 1, Paul writes, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now, he who speaks in a tongue edifies or benefits himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. But he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. 
Uh, dropping down to verse 12, it says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now going down to verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things done for let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now dropping down to verse 40, he concludes by saying, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, it is unclear in this passage of scripture whether this ability to speak a foreign language was just a natural talent and the language, that, uh, and the language was something they learned themselves or whether it was a spiritual, supernatural gift from God. Now, if it was something supernatural, it certainly wasn't the same miracle as noted on the day of Pentecost. Now, no interpreter was needed on the day of Pentecost. An interpreter is noted as needed in relation to those who spoke in tongues here in this chapter. Now, if it was a supernatural gift, the purpose of that gift was not to inflate the ego of the one who had the gift, but to serve others with that gift, to share and to teach the truth of God to others. It was useless unless it was used to serve and edify other people, much like those who translate sermons in Europe to those of us who travel there and only speak English. Now back a couple of chapters in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul notes two gifts as different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. There are those who can speak different languages and there are those who can interpret those languages for others who speak a different language. So in conclusion, all biblical examples of speaking in tongues stand in stark contrast to the type of speaking in tongues done in some churches today, where the speaker utters a language that sounds like gibberish, not an actual human language. In the biblical examples, the language barrier was miraculously broken down, and it wasn't put up with gibberish that could not be understood. In the biblical examples, we do have the hearers who understood what was being said, and more importantly, What was communicated shared the wonderful truths of God that are found in the Bible.